If you've watched any of our earlier tutorials on recording on improvised spaces, you know that we use our shop here at DW Fern World Headquarters as a control room during the sessions. This works out pretty well because the control room has decent acoustics and it's reasonably well isolated from the performers out in our part storage area. However, there's a couple serious drawbacks to that. One is that while we're using the shop for the control room, its normal purpose is mostly compromised. We can't really do anything in there. And the other problem is that it takes two to three hours to set that up each time we want to use it, depending on the complexity of the session, and almost as much time to tear it down. So the solution to that is to have a permanent control room that's always set up and ready to go whenever we want to do a session. I've thought about various ways of doing that over the years, yeah. and the best way is probably to add on to the existing building when you do that, you probably will end up with very good isolation between the new control room and the rest of the building, particularly if it's designed properly. But the expense is, is quite high. Putting in new foundation and footings, a new roof, all those kinds of things adds up to a very expensive project. So we didn't want to do that. We wanted to use some of the existing space. So we looked around and we found an underutilized section of our a uh, basement part storage area that could be converted into a permanent control room. This space has some limitations, however. There are certain physical constraints which limit the size that we can make this control room, but we felt that it was adequate. There's a uh, support post that will be used to define one of the walls because we can just bury that inside the wall rather than have it on the inside of the control room. Another problem is that there's a large steel I-beam that runs through the space and that defines one of the walls maximum extent. On the plus side, the ceiling height is quite high. We have about 10 feet of clearance in here, so that makes it pretty easy to put in a fairly sophisticated ceiling and still have reasonable height in the finished control room. There is a window to the outside, which normally would be a potential problem, but for us it's not. It's pretty quiet here. The outside walls are made of concrete block, and a certain part of it is underground, so we have very good isolation from outside noise. The first step was to make some very precise measurements of the space so we knew exactly where everything was located so we could begin our design. I used AutoCAD for the layout of this because that's what we use to design our metalwork and front panels and so forth. But any design program will do as long as you can scale it properly. Once we had the basic outline of the space entered into AutoCAD, we were able to experiment with moving the walls as necessary to see how we could accommodate the equipment that we wanted to put into this room. In typical construction, often the dimensions are multiples of four feet, which makes very efficient use of building materials, but acoustically is a terrible situation. It's beyond the scope of this tutorial to go into the details of how to design an acoustical space, but one rule of thumb is you never want your dimensions to be multiples of two, because that's almost guaranteed to give you acoustical problems. I made scaled drawings of each of the items that has to go into the room, the speakers, the computers, the racks, and made sure that they would all fit and the arrangement would, would work well. Ideally, this room would be bigger. We have to put the main monitor speakers in the corners of the room, which is usually not a good idea. In an ideal situation, these big monitor speakers would be soffit mounted, which would provide the best possible monitoring environment. But often you have to work with the situation you have, and so we had to end up with these speakers in the corners. Once I had the basic design completed, I contacted our contractor, Mark Thompson of MW Thompson Builders, who built this original building and has worked with me on a number of different studio projects over the years. We sat down and looked at the drawing and discussed the various options, talked about materials, and how we were going to accomplish this within the budget. Mark is always very good at coming up with new materials, 
he's always on the lookout for new things that could be useful in any kind of construction. Once we had all the details worked out, it was just a matter of making a detailed drawing with all the information that would be needed in order to construct this. We decided to use metal studs for a couple reasons. For one thing, they're dimensionally more stable, don't change with changes in temperature and humidity as much as wood does. And they also provide some additional benefit in terms of sound transmission loss through the walls. We decided to go with a double studded wall, which means that it's a six inch plate rather than a four inch is typically used in, in wall construction. And the studs for one wall are staggered from the studs on the opposite side of the wall. This prevents coupling between the two walls and increases the sound transmission loss considerably. Using the types of drywall that we specified for this, we had a calculated STC, or sound transmission class, of 55 dB. Whenever you hear something called a class, you know that it's not an exact measurement. And that's certainly true of the STC measurements. For one thing, they only cover a limited frequency range from our point of view. The lowest frequency is 125 hertz and the highest is 4,000. Now high frequencies are very easy to stop. You could stop 20,000 hertz with a sheet of cardboard, but low frequencies require a lot more mass. So our STC of 55 dB applies to those mid-range frequencies, mostly in the speech range, but does not cover the lower frequencies such as you would get from a drum set. In our case, that wasn't such a major consideration because the drums are out in the garage, which has another fairly substantial wall in between the drums and the control room walls. So 55 dB was deemed sufficient for what we wanted to do. Standard home drywall construction gives you about 33 dB STC which means that if you stand on one side and speak, you can actually understand the words on the other side. Adding insulation inside the wall gives you another 3 to 5 dB, but contrary to what most people believe, it really does not add a whole lot to the sound isolation. However, insulation inside the wall will help to damp the resonance inside the wall cavity. In an ideal recording studio, you would have walls that were at least 60 dB of isolation. 60 to 65 dB is usually about the maximum you can get with conventional construction. And that requires solid concrete block. Metal studs give us about 5 to 10 dB better isolation than we would have if the same wall was constructed with wooden studs. Every time you double the mass of a wall, you get 5 to 6 dB better isolation. So you can see that you rapidly run out of options once you start to get above 55 to 60 dB. A wall constructed with two layers of drywall on either side will improve the isolation somewhat to about 40 to 45 dB. If we added a second layer of drywall to the outside of our walls, we could get another few dB, but the cost just didn't seem to be worth it. In any control room, there's certain penetrations through the walls that need to be made in order to make the room practical. For the audio and data lines, we used 3-inch PVC conduit that runs through the ceiling and down the wall inside the control room. This provides about 35 feet of uh, conduit in between where it comes out in the hallway and where it at the other end where it comes out near the equipment in the control room. Because it has two 90 degree bends, not a whole lot of sound gets through that. And once the wires are all run, we seal the ends of that conduit at both ends with sealing compounds so that no sound can go through there. For the AC wiring, just two very small penetrations need to be made in the ceiling drywall. And those were caulked with lots of special acoustic caulk in order to prevent any sound from leaking around that wire. When this building was constructed in 1997, Mark suggested that we put in several lintels along this basement wall. That would allow us to add windows easily in the future. We decided to take advantage of that, even though we already have one window, and put another window in, a small one, a sealed window, 
in order to provide a little bit more natural light into the control room. This required cutting through the stucco on the outside and then breaking through the block wall. The window we use is a conventional insulated glass window, nothing special about it, but it does not open. It was designed as a sealed window. If you are in a high noise environment, you might want to add another piece of glass inside that, but in our situation, it's not necessary. Once the framing was complete and the window opening ready, it was time to start adding the insulation. We use conventional fiberglass insulation in all the walls and in the ceiling of our new control room. Once the insulation was in place, it was time to start adding the drywall. In our case, we used the special sound blocking drywall on the inner walls of the control room and conventional 5 8 drywall on the outside. The ceiling was a special case. We wanted to isolate this from the space above as thoroughly as we could, so we decided to go to a double drywall construction. First, furring strips were added across the existing floor joists above. The drywall fastened to that. Once the first layer of drywall was in place, resilient strips were added and the second layer of drywall was connected to that. All the drywall was thoroughly taped and sealed and then a coat of primer was placed over top of that. We did not want any penetrations at all on the walls, so we could not put in conventional electrical boxes because that would really destroy our sound isolation. So all the electrical wiring is done on the surface and the electrical boxes for the outlets and switches are carefully positioned so that they screw directly into a stud and not into empty drywall. Our original plan was to use the existing building HVAC system, particularly because the supply and return ducts ran right outside in the hallway outside of our new control room. However, Obtaining good isolation through an HVAC system is very complex and expensive. It requires changes in ductwork size, many bends, plenums which take up space inside the control room, and other special measures in order to prevent sound from just traveling right through that ductwork from one area to the other. After consulting with our HVAC contractor, we decided the best way to do it was to put a separate system in just for the control room. What we ended up using is what's commonly called a mini split. It's like a conventional two unit air conditioner where you have a compressor unit outside and then the air handling unit and evaporator inside. This system was designed just to do one room and it was sized to take care of the heat load that we expected. You can calculate the heat load fairly easily by adding up the wattage of all the equipment you expect to have in the room. Virtually all the power that goes into your equipment is eventually turned into heat inside the room. Depending on your climate, it may be important to have air conditioning available even in the winter. So be sure that the system you specify is capable of running an air conditioning mode down to the lowest temperature you expect you're going to need air conditioning in your space. These units are very quiet, and any noise you hear in this recording is actually coming from the fans and the radar, not from the HVAC system. In any studio and control room situation, doors and windows are usually the weak link. The other weak link is flanking paths that go above or below your walls into your control room. In our case, we didn't have that problem, but it's still important to take care with your walls and ceilings and everything to make sure everything's properly sealed. For the window, we use two pieces of glass, each set in the separate wall, one on the inner wall, one on the outer wall, so there's no direct coupling between the two pieces of glass. The two pieces of glass should be different thicknesses. In our case, they're half inch and three eighths of an inch. Our half inch piece of glass is actually made up of two quarter inch pieces of glass put together, which is much more cost effective than a single piece of half inch glass. The door that we use is a metal solid core door. It's sealed with a magnetic seal. We always knew that this would be the weak link in our control room isolation, so we designed it so that if necessary we could add a second door. And that's usually the best way to improve the isolation of doors, to use double doors. 
one on each side of the wall. You always have to take into account the weak link in your sound isolation. In our case, it's definitely the door, so there wasn't a whole lot of point in coming up with a 60 dB wall if we only have a 40 dB door. We used a suspended ceiling with a conventional ceiling grid, but we used a better acoustical tile than is normally used in most home or business construction. This ceiling tile is 5 eighths of an inch thick and has considerably better sound absorbing qualities and sound isolating qualities than the tiles that are used typically in a ceiling like this. In addition to the ceiling tile, we also added a layer of about a foot of conventional fiberglass insulation above the suspended ceiling. You want to have as much absorption as possible in the ceiling of your room, whether it's a control room or a studio. It's the easiest place to add absorption and provides the best sound for both spaces. Final stage of construction was adding carpeting to the floor. We picked a commercial grade carpet without a pad that goes directly onto the concrete floor. This isn't the most luxurious carpet to walk on, but it's very practical when you're putting heavy equipment on it, especially if you have equipment that needs to roll around, like our smaller rack, which is on wheels. Once the room was completed, it was time to move in the equipment and set it up and see how it works. The furniture we're using was originally designed for use in a radio station. It was built by a company called Studio Technology, which is local to us in Kennett Square, PA, and they build radio station and TV studio furniture for stations all over the country. They had this large table available, but it was a little bit too big for our space, so we needed to have them cut it down some, and in the process we had them add two rack bays on either side so that we could put some additional rack equipment in it. It also has wiring channels internally with holes in appropriate places so the wiring can be done without being visible. It's very heavy and solid. It provides an excellent space to work on. We ran our mic lines out to the performing spaces in the basement and also in the garage. The wiring we use for that and for all the interconnects within the room is made by Gotham Audio. We use single pair, double pair, and four pair cables depending on the application. In every case where we had to run wiring through our conduit, we pulled several additional runs so that we could accommodate any future expansion. This rack contains all our microphone preamplifiers. It's a combination of DW Firm VT1, VT2, and VT12 mic preamps. Each is hardwired to a jack out in the studio space. The outputs of all the mic preamp and most of the outboard gear comes up to an XLR patch panel which we built for the purpose. I don't like using TRS jacks for patching, especially at mic level. They are an insidious source of distortion and noise and just get worse over time. XLR connectors are a lot more reliable way to make interconnections. If you clapped your hands in the raw space with just the drywall walls and the concrete floor, the reverberation time was two or three seconds, and it showed no particularly bad characteristics like a flutter echo or frequencies that were emphasized in the reverberation. Obviously, a space with that long a reverberation time is not suitable for monitoring in a control room environment or in a performing environment. So I knew we would need to add some sound absorption to the room. I built sound absorbing panels which utilized four inch thick rock wool inside them underneath a burlap cover. Some of the panels are just pure absorbers and others of them include diffusion elements. This one was used experimentally to determine how the diffusion would sound. The other ones have the diffusion elements in back of the burlap. Although the room sounds very good right now, I'm still experimenting with placement of the panels and possibly some more diffusion in order to get the optimum sound out of the room. So, how's our new control room working out? 
Well, for one thing, it's a joy to just be able to go in and flip a switch and turn everything on and start working, not have to spend a couple of hours setting up each time. Our first session was sort of a shakedown to make sure everything was working properly. Although we had tested everything multiple times ahead of time, you're never sure if everything's really going to work the way you think it will. There were no surprises and everything went smoothly, and the monitoring environment sounded very good. Now that we have this nice new control room, music production will be much more pleasant, and in addition, we'll have a good laboratory for testing new product ideas.